So can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So um, first of all, I want to thank um, the comrades at the collective for um, giving me this opportunity to talk to you. And, you know, I'm really excited about hearing from you how things are going in India. Um, and I hope on a personal note, um, you and your loved ones are doing okay, or I dare not stay well under the circumstances since we're all coping with this, but I hope you are, and your loved ones are okay. Um, I'm going to um, talk about um, the US, but I want to set the stage first um, as to what this pandemic perhaps means for us in terms of being Marxists and lefties, and most of all, what it means for us in terms of who the most vulnerable are, who the most essential workers are, and the point of view, how we see the world from the point of view of the working class, and how capitalism sees the world from its point of view. So I want to set a little bit of a perspective first and um, then go on to talk about the U.S. I also want to let comrades know that um, I am running, um, I'm associated with a new journal called Spectre. And um, in the Spectre journal, I am running a column uh, called uh, Dispatches from the Frontlines of Care in order to highlight the voices of working class people who are doing the, um, the bulk of care work in these pandemic times and who under normal circumstances are, of course, the least paid and the least valued. So if comrades um, on the collective are in touch with or actually work with um, workers in the care sector, you know, uh, rubbish, uh, trash removal work comrades, um, teacher comrades, Anganwadi workers, then please do get in touch with me um, because I would love to highlight their voices. Okay, so that is my little introduction and then I'm going to launch straight into the talk. I'm going to read from a computer so I hope it's um, okay. Just uh, you know make some sign if um, you can't hear properly or you want me to go slower. The economy is sheltering in place. How long can it survive that? asked the Los Angeles Times. The Lieutenant Governor of Texas, Dan Patrick, said on Fox News that lots of grandparents would be willing to die in order to save the economy for their grandchildren. And now Trump is considering reopening the US economy as that is apparently more important than the health of workers and their families. Our rulers and their newspapers are worried about the economy, but I'm exhausted from reading and hearing about how the coronavirus is affecting the economy, how it is hurting the economy, how we need to save the economy. Reading the mainstream news outlets, you would think that it was the economy that was being evicted from houses incarcerated in prisons, forced to work, dying, or being fired. Welcome to capitalism, where things are valued more than life, and thing-making, i.e. profit-making, is valued more than life-making. Around the world, governments only started to respond to the virus once its spread was already impossible to control by their respective medical infrastructures. It has been instructive to see how stubbornly capitalism refused to protect life while panicking over stocks. Indeed, 
the initial callousness of our rulers to the virus was in part due to the fact that the most affected were our elderly, i.e. people who we may love, but who for capitalism have already outlived their use. They don't work, that is produce for profit. They draw pensions, benefits, that is take from profit. The short-term vision that defines capitalism failed to see. Yeah. Yeah. The, the short-term vision that defines capitalism failed to see that unless we flatten the curve, we could all be affected. If the hospitals become full of 65 plus year olds, what would happen if the 40-year-old had a heart attack or the 11-year-old developed something potentially fatal? This pandemic demonstrates clearly and tragically that our coming political struggles cannot limit themselves to being struggles for better infrastructure alone. We must demand something more fundamental to organize society differently, where we value life over things, people over profits. What do we mean when we say capitalism pits life-making against profit-making? The social capacities with which we make life and the institutions with which we maintain life and satisfy our needs have always been undervalued by capitalism. This is why life-making services such as health, education, public transport have always received less funding than defense and crime and are always the first to be privatized or underfunded. Even food production under capitalism is conducted strictly on the basis of profit margins rather than hungry humans. During a devastating famine in Bengal, as you probably know, in 1942-43, the racist British government continued to ex export over 70,000 tons of rice annually to maintain its trade profits an estimated 3 million people died in this famine. In the same way, our capitalist dystopia can run a candidate for US elections, at the highest office of government, the US presidency, who can officially say that he is going to veto a bill which guarantees healthcare to everyone. And this he can say openly and publicly during a pandemic because this is what Joe Biden promised to do as the president of the United States if a Medicare for all bill were to come to him for ratification. Similarly, I just saw reports um, yesterday that Wisconsin farmers were actually um, disposing of getting rid of milk because uh, they were not going to make profit from the production of milk. So there were literally, there, there were images on the internet that you cannot believe. They are opening these milk cans and just throwing, um, um, getting rid of the milk on the streets, uh, on the roadside. So obviously no one in the United States or anywhere in the world needs milk anymore, right? So this is what Wisconsin farmers are doing. Um the U.S. is, then we come to the U.S., is incidentally one of the countries least equipped to deal with a pandemic. This for many reasons. First, it outright denies healthcare to a vast majority of people. Second, it ties healthcare to employment. So when people lose their jobs, as they will in a coming recession, they will have no healthcare. 
So in this country, if you don't have a job, you don't have health care. And even when you have a job, you may not have health care if your job is really low wage, wage, right? So then the employer will try not to get you health care. But if you have a regular job, you may have health care. But that means if you lose the regular job, your health care is gone, okay? Third, this country encourages its people to think that only two categories of the social whole are sacred, the individual and the institution of the bourgeois nuclear family. Issues of public good and social good have been either deliberately ignored or actively discouraged by the country's politicians. The result is a society with 2.7 hospital beds per 1,000 people and 120 guns per 100 civilians. As life-making work is devalued by capitalism, so are workers who perform these tasks. Nurses, teachers, home care workers, farm workers, cleaners, without whose work it would be impossible to maintain life, are those very people who are paid the lowest wages and have the worst work conditions. A pandemic tragically clarifies both the importance of life-making work and the perils of devaluing it. Take the case of home health care workers in the U.S., whose work has become vital during this crisis. Nearly 90% of home health care workers and nurses aides in the U.S. who work in nursing homes, hospices, and with the elderly in general are women. More than half of them are women of color. On an average, they earn less than $10 an hour with no paid sick time or health care benefits. More often than not, these women do not like to take time off as they feel they're needed by their vulnerable patients. These are the people most in contact with the folks who have the highest chance of suffering from the virus. Then are those who are not low-wage women of color safe? Hardly. 40 years of neoliberalism may have taught us to think that one can keep oneself protected with a magical barrier of individuality, but reality is both different and more social. The social institutions that were gutted in order for neoliberal austerity to breathe means that these very low wage working women that one may try to avoid are now forced to go to work since austerity made sure that their wages are low, their benefits non-existent, and their housing always at risk. So they all, they, so they have to go to work. I just saw shared on uh, social media this incredible um, video of a a vegetable uh, vendor in Bengal who sings this song. He's composed a song um, on the coronavirus where the refrain for the song is basically, um, if we don't go to work, what? Do, how do we eat, right? So the, uh, the lowest wage workers have to, in a way, go to work. The New York Times um, yesterday published a very interesting report of... Um, so the Times tracked um, the own usage of a number of people, and it showed that high-income people can actually afford to stay at home, so their cell phones were not moving, whereas low-income groups had to go to work, and it showed that their cell phones were moving or being mobile. So it's, again, clear that the most vulnerable, the lowest wage workers have to go to work because of, you know, the last 40 years have made sure that unless they go to work, they will starve. So since they're having to absolutely go to work, it also means that the curve is not being flattened of the virus because there are people who are constantly out in public. 
Um, so this means that women at the front lines of care cannot afford to socially isolate themselves because they cannot afford to lose their jobs. In their daily routine of going to work, they have to come in contact with a multitude of people in order to be able to socially reproduce their own lives. Some of these people are those very people who think they're safe in their individual bubble. The coronavirus recognizes neither class, nor race, nor gender. It is utterly democratic. It'll come into the lives of all of us because capitalism fails to protect the lives of some of us. But the pandemic is also a clarifying tragedy. It has forced governments and industry to direct production and policy towards the one thing that they always deprioritize in normal times human life. The case of Italy is a perfect one before, uh, is a, the case of Italy is a perfect before and after picture of capitalism's priorities. According um, to Italian socialists, public funding for healthcare in Italy was reduced in the last decade by about 37 billion euros. Most of these cuts took place from 2010 to 2015, while the IMF was in control of the country's economy. Over this decade, 359 hospitals were closed, while smaller hospitals abundant. Now, with the virus stalking the country, Italian, Italy's uh, prime minister has ordered the closing down of all productive activity throughout the territory that is not strictly necessary, crucial, and indispensable to guarantee uh, essential goods and services. Funnily enough, stock markets did not make that list of essential services. What did make the list should make us reflect on what kind of work actually sustains human lives and social well-being. <laughs> Italy, like many states in the U.S., has included the following on its uh, essential services list. Supermarkets, grocery stores, all shops selling food, pharmacies, and the production of medicines and medical equipment, transport for medical staff, garbage collection, teaching by distance learning, everything necessary to continue the supply of electricity, gas, water, and fuel, and so on. It has taken the tragedy of a global pandemic to reveal what capitalism likes to keep hidden, that the motor of the economy and society is human labor, not capital. Let us do a thought experiment and compare the wages of these essential workers with CEOs and investment bankers, neither of whom, it turns out, we actually need to run society. In the United States, the annual mean wage of chief executives is between $200,000 to $300,000. Counselors, social workers is $49,000. Preschool teachers, $34,000. This is not monthly income. This is an annual income. Elementary and middle school teachers, $62,000. Food service workers, $22,000. Janitors and cleaners, $28,000. So the CEOs earn almost 40 times that of janitors. Um, sorry, a uh, hundred times more than uh, janitors. Not only are these workers' lives and work considered inessential during so-called normal times, the services they provide are the first to fall under austerity's acts. In the context of a flu epidemic in 2019, Aaron Reeves, who studies public health at Oxford University, asked why the flu can have such dramatic consequences in some of the richest countries with the most modern healthcare systems on earth. His answer can be seen as a tragic forewarning for COVID-19, which was to strike in a few months. Reeves' research showed that cuts to healthcare and social care spending in these countries had weakened the capacity of their health systems to respond to preventable illness among vulnerable populations. In the United States alone, 126 rural hospitals were closed down since 
2010. While the stock market crash of 2008 and 9 were ripping people's lives apart through job losses and foreclosures, the United States elite thought the best path towards social stability was closing hospitals and bailing banks. And this is coming back now to affect uh, all of us in this pandemic crisis. I also want to uh, say that although the virus itself is very democratic, it is affecting everyone from Bolsonaro to Trump to now uh, UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson apparently is in hospital in a ventilator. However, while the virus may be democratic, the cure and the access to medical services um, due to the virus is anything but democratic. So the most vulnerable, the, the most poor countries are having the least access to medical care, the least uh, amount of testing is being done, and are, are so vulnerable people are dying at a much more um, astonishing rate than the ruling class who have access to all of this and people are getting tested all the time. So in the city of Chicago, which is the nearest city to me, um, the, the teachers union just published this um, statistics that the uh, the number of deaths, the total number of deaths uh, by the virus in the city of Chicago, 11% of the dead are white. And guess how? what is the percentage of blacks? 68. So 68% of the people dead are black people, while 11% of those dead are white. So this just reveals to us again the uh, tremendous social inequality. Uh, so the virus is a way for, again, revealing to us something that lefties have always known, the tremendous inequalities of uh, capitalism. In these extraordinary times, then, how do you think we will fare without a banker? And how, think, will we fare without a nurse or a supermarket person, salesperson? The pandemic has shown us in very clear terms the importance of care work and life-making work for the sustenance of life and society. For the first time in decades, governments are taking unusual measures to institutionalize this insight. They're opening more hospitals, albeit makeshift. They're suspending the making of things that are unnecessary for life, and they're dispersing funds to help out families in need. It is unfair to compare these government measures to war times. Uh, sorry, it is not unfair to compare these government measures to war times. But in the war times, what governments do is ramp up production. Right now, what we need is to ramp down production of inessential goods. But when the crisis passes, we should be prepared to wage just such a battle against our rulers and the system they protect. We cannot go back to the old normal of mindlessly churning the wheels of commerce solely for the sake of profit and devastating our planet in the process. A new way of organizing society nourished by the priorities of life making must become our new normal. Going forward, we must demand workers who have to staff essential services, such as nurse, supermarket staff, street cleaners, and others, should be paid extra during th these times. I'm calling it pandemic pay. Nationalization of all private hospitals. Spain has done this on a temporary basis, admitting that private healthcare is unable to save lives. We must demand that such moves to nationalize hospitals become universal and permanent. Free uh, all mortgage and rent payment must be suspended, otherwise people will be forced to break isolation in order to work to pay bills. Free laptops and Wi-Fi at home and free lunch programs for all students when schools close. Free childcare for parents who have to work. We must demand there be no deportations and immigration raids. Ireland and Portugal have already done this, has legalized 
all um, undocumented workers, and we must demand that all governments should follow suit. Every building that is not housing humans for free, hotels, rich people's second and third homes, need to be occupied to care for the homeless and the sick. Every building that is housing humans against their will, such as jails, prisons, internment camps, need to be abolished. And we must demand that there be no curtailing of civil, civil liberties using the virus as an excuse. Only capitalism could have invented a phrase social isolation to deal with the crisis. From a system that thrives on alienation and atomization, this should come as no surprise. But we cannot afford to socially isolate ourselves and build barriers against each other, either materially or politically. We have already seen an unprecedented flourishing of organized and spontaneous acts of care and solidarity amongst ordinary people. People are organizing neighborhood and citywide mutual aid networks to care for each other. Such networks need to become global, such as when doctors from Cuba and China rushed over to Italy to help stem the rising tide of death. This is why we should be calling for physical isolation, but social solidarity. For in these ruinous times, there still are luminous acts of anti-capitalism. Entire regions are devising novel ways to thank their healthcare workers. Educators are offering free online lessons. Counselors free help for mental health patients. Palestinian farmers are leaving food by the wayside in order for people who can't buy food to have access to it. This instinct for care and solidarity is what makes us human, and we cannot let capitalism make us forget that. We are creating beauty even when our surroundings have been vandalized by profit. This crisis beyond the shadow of a doubt has shown us that care work makes all work possible. Our job now is to ensure that all politics become the politics of care. Imagine what would happen if we refused to go back to work if our above demands were not met. Could they survive without us? So while we help each other through this, let us also plan our future. Physically isolate yourself, politically isolate the rich, and fight like hell for a society that values life-making over Profit making. Thank you. Yes, that was a very comprehensive uh, 30 minutes, just the last 30 minutes by Dr. Mahesh and especially the set of demands that uh, you spoke about, ma'am. Uh, very, it's been a long time that these kinds of demands are being raised in the USA, and these kinds of demands are being spoken about so extensively in the USA. Um, now, we would like to take more questions. If uh, uh, those who have been joining us either on Facebook or to do have any questions, please leave your questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, just to get the discussion started, uh, I'd just like to ask you, uh, you spoke about like the conditions and created by the crisis. Uh, have you been seeing any developments in the political arena, uh, be it in the DSA or in the political arena at large? Because we've been hearing about a number of strikes recently, most famously the Amazon uh, walkout, uh, for which the employee was uh, punished and uh, persecuted. Uh, have you been uh, following any of these developments, recent developments, and what are some of the spaces where you think productively organizing has begun towards the demands that you spoke about? Okay, so that's a very important question, and I. Um, wanted to leave that for the Q&A because this is this is the most important um, place to start for us as lefties as to how workers are actually organizing in the crisis. So the first thing is um, we have to look at it again from the workers' point of view and capital's point of view, right? So um, the uh, capitalists 
you, this is un, almost unbelievable, are actually closing um, hospitals during the con- p- pandemic. They have actually ordered the closing of a hospital because it is not running on profit. This is during a pandemic. They're doing this right now. While General Electric workers who work for the company General Electric are forcing General Electric, they, they've threatened to strike unless General Electric produced ventilators. Okay. So this is this is kind of gives you the contrast of how working class people are responding. Um, so it started first with walkouts, right? So there was a uh, it, it, there was the chicken um, meat production company, Purdue is the name of the, it's not like the university, it's a P-E-R-D-U-E. So the chicken production company, Purdue, um, workers were not given um, protect personal protective gear, nothing, and they were forced to come to work. And the workers just walked out. They said, I'm sorry, is chicken that important? Um, you know, are, are dead chicken more important than our actual lives and the lives of our families? We're not coming to work unless you do this. Okay, so that was one. Secondly, uh, you saw the um, Amazon walkouts that that were happening because Amazon workers are, um, uh, you know, under uh, tremendous stress and and being. Um, are, are producing, you know, under these um, extraordinarily crowded conditions, you know, they have to work shoulder to shoulder with each other. So the question of, you know, sort of six foot apart, which is what the government has said, we must all be six foot apart, is impossible in a in an Amazon warehouse. So, uh, and, and, you know, I saw this tremendously useful um um statement from Amazon workers, which said, look, if you are ordering things, inessential things online, right, then the production, uh, then our w- working hours go up and more people are needed. So while you go on Amazon and you are o- ordering what they said was rubber chickens, like they're these toys, like yellow rubber chickens that, you know, kids can play with. Do you really need to order yellow rubber chickens during a pandemic? Because this will force um, these workers into warehouses, again, loading and doing things. Now, let's not stop there either, right? So um, truckers have to carry these packages across countries in order to bring them to our doors. This means that truck stops have to remain open, you know, so that the truckers can take a break while they're driving long distance. Truck stops remaining open means that in these truck stops, workers have to produce food, have to clean the work. So, you know, just because you're ordering a cute pair of shoes, it means you're basically putting this whole supply chain of workers at risk. So my, um, I just wrote about this recently. I said, you know, if you're ordering medicines online, go for it. But if it's a cute pair of shoes, maybe you shouldn't do this right now, you know. So uh, the other factor that is happening is nurses are in the front lines of care. They are not being given personal protective equipment. Okay, this is the this is the richest country in the world. And here, our nurses who are saving lives are not being given protective care. There are heartbreaking images on social media and the news um, of nurses holding pictures of their dead colleagues, colleagues who died because of this. So there is actually a uh, protest brewing. Nurses in New York have already done a public protest about how nurses are being disrespected and they do not have the protective gear to to work in their workplaces. Um, So I think there is all of this anger and um, class rage that is brewing right now because in a concentrated manner, we are looking at the cruelty and inhumanness of capitalism. What happens to these isolated moments of protest is something that, uh, you know, is um, both the left's responsibility and also the most difficult thing to organize because um, the DSA is uh, organizing mutual aid networks, which is fantastic, right? Uh, But 
you know, the, um, I was hoping more to come out of the Bernie Sanders campaign and it hasn't. Um, and so, and the left in the U S the revolutionary left, you know, not the social democratic Mm -hmm. left, but the revolutionary left in the U S is very, very weak still. So, um, I think this is going to be the challenge as to whether we can weave a tapestry, a national tapestry of protest and insurrection through these sort of localized forms of protest. Uh, there are two more questions around the particular strategies of organizing. So there's one question from Neville who's asking, what has been the role of unionization in these kinds of uh, how they have featured in, and I just like to add: have has this opened up scope for uh, scope for more unionization in the recent past uh, instances that you spoke about? And the second question is from Priyoshmita, who that who says a group in Los Angeles named Reclaimers are taking over government-owned vacant properties and helping homeless people to take those over. Is an interesting step. Are there any other such moves by the urban homeless? And how is the housing crisis responding to this? Uh, uh, the, state, the call to stay at home in the quarantine period? Well, uh, the, the U.S. is not dealing with the housing crisis at all. Um, it, unlike Britain, which has ordered um, uh, uh, hotels to become um, shelter in place for homeless people, yeah? So um, the U.S. is not doing that. You will see people in Los Angeles actually... There's a terrible uh, photograph that was on the uh, front page of LA Times of um, um, uh, folks, uh, homeless folks, just lying on the on the street and practicing physical isolation. Like they're lying on the street six feet apart from each other, which is just heartbreaking and tragic. So the U.S. has done nothing. Um, housing, um, you know, the, the the demand is uh, rent. Um, uh, blocking rent and mortgage payment for months. Um, some people have done it, uh, but it's again out of individual charity and kindness. There is no federal mandate. Um, secondly, uh, unionization. Um, I'm not sure that unionization figures will actually go up during this crisis simply because people are mostly staying home. So it is not you know, unionization is a process where you have to have a collective, um, you know, sort of physical collective response to uh, in, in whatever. So this is um, this is hard to do when you are at home and in physical isolation. So um, the unionization figures, uh, as far as I know, um, have not gone up right now, but. Having said that, I think it is very, very important to um, also emphasize that calls for more unionization are coming from everywhere. Okay, so the unions, especially unions which are, um, you know, socially progressive, like uh, nurses and teachers in the United States, which have already, you know, in the last two years, um, had a whole host of wildcat strikes, yeah? So those unions are actually calling for much more radical action and and um, and things like that. But I don't think we're going to... Oh, and the construction workers have just called um, for... Um, a stop in construction. So I think the even the union bureaucracy is getting more radicalized simply because their rank and file is demanding it. But I don't know if actual numerically uh, the union numbers are going to rise during the crisis, but I am fairly certain we're going to see some rise after the crisis passes and people go back to work. Uh, coming to the global scenario, the next uh, set of questions is uh, Avinash asks, what is the role of China in this crisis? And if you could talk a bit about how that's being discussed in the American uh, media or within the American public. And another question from Facebook from Paloma, who's asking, the IMF and the World Bank are already talking about a second wave of structural adjustment. When capitalism is so organized, how do we resist it in a globally coordinated manner? Well, the second question is the million-dollar question, isn't it? That we're all 
kind of debating. So let me go back to the China question, because the one thing that I haven't talked about is the escalating um, cases of racism against Chinese people and Asian people in the U.S., okay? So it is absolutely disgraceful the way, not just Trump, okay, Trump is a racist monster, everyone knows that, and really, uh, you know, liberals and left people don't take him seriously. So, but he led the charge in calling it the Chinese virus, okay? as He said that in a press briefing from the White House. This is the Chinese virus, which is basically a dog whistle to racists on the street to go after people who even remotely look Chinese, right? So, um, when when we didn't have all this lockdown or whatever, um, and, you know, shops and things were still open, I, my 11-year-old uh, daughter and I went to our local independent bookstore to buy some books. And uh, the the person who was at the bookstore was a Purdue student who was uh, Chinese. And I said, have you had any trouble? He, he said, oh, yeah, plenty. You know, people move away from me when I walk. You know, people have spat at me. So this is just, you know, incredible. So that's one. Uh, the newspapers are, uh, the, the more liberal newspapers like New York Times is still bashing China on its front pages. Like it'll say, you know, China, so yesterday's big front page news was uh, not that the U. Uh, that the UK does not have enough ventilators, but that China did not tell us how many people actually died in China. Like, really, is that the most important news now? That China did not tell us how many people died? I mean, I'm not a fan of China or the authoritarian government structure in China, but, you know, that is not the most important news we have to um, deal with. So uh, the U.S. is using its trade rivalry and political rivalry with the rising superpower dumb of China uh, using the, the COVID-19 pandemic to actually escalate that and to whip up racism against China. China itself, I think, because of its centralized authoritarian dictatorship-like government structure, actually did way more than the U.S. in order to contain the crisis. So I think we will find once all this is passed and we open up the ledger books that there will be there have been far more deaths, uh, far less deaths in China, and far more in the U.S. Okay, so we will find that. For sure. China has also notably sent doctors to various parts of the globe to help out with the crisis. China has its own ambitions to become the next imperial power. So it's doing all this as, you know, sort of soft imperialism and so on. So all that goes to say that the U.S. is hardly the nation to be criticizing China, even though China is a dictatorship, because the U.S. has done far less towards public health and is doing far more for autocratic actions than uh, it has the right to speak. Uh, and talking about the U.S.'s action right now on the global scale, as we like see the rising death toll within the US and across the world. We, let us also remember that uh, despite the ongoing crisis, the embargo on Venezuela and Cuba and particularly Iran has been uh, continuing despite all of yeah. this. Uh, um, exactly. Yeah, and the United States has done nothing to, in, in, uh, to help uh, other countries. In fact, it is incredible what the U.S. did yesterday, which is ventilators were going to Barbados. This is a tiny island nation with like 344 ventilators for 3 million people or something like that. I, I just, I've forgotten the figure. I just read it. The U.S. raided the ventilators and redirected them back to the U.S., so these ventilators were bound for Barbados. The U.S. stole them like pirate and brought them to the U.S. I mean, this is what U.S., you know, uh, power looks like in, in the world. So, I mean, and as you say rightly, 
Iran, which does need, you know, our our um, help, etc., it, it, it is the the embargo is still on, which means food, essential medicines, all life making activities are in scarce resource because of U.S. policies in place. So, I mean, this is like the U.S. is not a country that can boast about you know uh, calling. Um, other countries dictatorial and cruel so anyway but i wanted to go back to the question that um came to us yeah. on, on facebook about what should we do and you're absolutely right that capitalism's uh, response is very organized the capitalist class historically is far more organized than the working class um but i think it is these kind of efforts that we are making, like these, you know, sort of lectures that we are holding to talk to each other, to educate each other about what's happening, should lay the, the basis for a new global left to arise, right? So this is this was not the case. If you think back, some of you may even be too young to, to remember, this was not the case. This kind of global solidarity and talking to each other was not the case even in 2008 when the economy crashed. You know, we didn't have Zoom sessions discussing uh, with comrades all over the world, you know, what that means or, you know, um, centering or highlighting the voices of vulnerable workers uh, globally. We were not doing that. So we are starting to do that in a way and putting each other in contact with each other and sharing our stories, I think, is an important um, basis for creating networks of solidarity and and stories, which, which hopefully will be the sort of... Um, ground for the emergence of a new global left. Um, in terms of the solidarity being expressed by the capitalist class across the world, we are seeing the kind of tactics that you mentioned with uh, regards to China being adopted in the US, we are seeing similar kinds of dogmatism being used even in India right now where uh, the virus is being identified with a particular religion or a particular region, be it the Northeast or Muslims in India. And there has been a flood of fake news and uh, bias coverage in the mainstream media bringing about shifting the public discussion to issues like this. Uh, so to talk about the ways in which the existing hierarchies, be it of race or caste or uh, gender, will be affected by a crisis like this. We have um, two questions. One is from Adarsh who asks, uh, reports of domestic violence against women and LGBTQ folk have multiplied during the pandemic as victims are forced to stay indoors. Uh, Dr. Tithi, can you speak about the impossible intervention here? Uh, mm. And the second one is a comment from Devotam Shah on uh, Facebook uh, uh, talking about how forms of untouchability are changing within the household in India over here uh, from his own middle class Bengali experience, uh, particularly <coughs> in rural spaces. And uh, new forms of untouchability are coming up as a response to this pandemic. So if you could talk a bit about, say, the changes in caste or in the American context, race relations as well. Uh, you spoke particularly about how uh, uh, people of color are being disproportionately affected, but how new forms of racial discrimination or uh, harassment are coming up as a result. Okay, this is a great question. So. Um, uh, so um, let me start with the domestic violence thing. So, um, you know, isolation in place uh, means that we stay at home. And homes can be, um, even under capitalism, homes can be places where we are nurtured, we relax, we have our loved ones. I'm actually quite enjoying being at home with my 11-year-old um, um, on, on a regular uh, basis. However, homes are also incredible theaters of violence under capitalism, right? So uh, abuse, sexual abuse, physical violence, um, especially towards women and children, go on rampantly under normal times under capitalism. And of course, this is going to uh, escalate during uh, the pandemic. We saw um, the... the um, this is not an idle speculation from, you know, a feminist uh, like me. This is actually proven by research. So when the Zika virus 
took hold in large parts of Africa, domestic violence absolutely skyrocketed al alongside of the, uh, the, the, the virus, okay? So um, I've been uh, looking at reports from uh, various parts of the world since the pandemic started. And China has this exact same uh, response that domestic violence escalated during uh, the crisis in China. My feminist comrades in um, Sri Lanka and Brazil are reporting the same thing. Um, the uh, domestic violence shelter where I used to volunteer in my town just called me saying, would you mind coming back because we are anticipating a rise in domestic violence because um, this stay at home order um, from the government. So um, this is and yesterday. Uh, a friend of mine in the Netherlands. So, you know, social Democrats often try to point towards the Netherlands being this a sort of heaven of social democracy where women are equal and everything is great. So a, a feminist friend in the Netherlands sent me this Dutch report. I mean, it's so horrific, which is this teacher teaching her students online by Zoom and while she's teaching that her partner, her male partner attacks her and uh, physically is violent towards her with all these children watching over Zoom. Okay, so this I think is going to escalate. What is our solution for that? Um, that is the more important question because we know it'll escalate. Our solution is to be very, very mindful of these um, fractures and fault lines in our society, you know? So uh, the colleague who often comes to work with, um, you know, covering her eyes and makeup and saying, I hit a door, you need to call her during this moment of isolation and ask her if she's okay and, you know, make sure that she, uh, is safe and, and so on. So we need to be, there is not much we can do except raise awareness and call people, especially women that we know might be in unsafe situations to, to make sure that they know that there's a place to go if they need to. Um, the second thing I want to say is, um, it, it goes, the same goes for race and racism. As you know, you know, racism against Chinese people are escalating in the U.S. Um, so uh, existing inequalities are only exacerbated through the crisis. So gender, race, etc. The caste um, question in the Indian context is a very important one because this is this is very interesting to me because this is a society, Brahminical uh, society is already a society that discriminates on the basis of physical touching, right? So this is a, this is a culture, Savarna culture is already a culture where touching or physical bodily contact is under uh, scrutiny and, and, policed, right? So that's, um, this is, the pandemic is kind of, if you are a Savarna Brahmin, the pandemic actually legitimizes in a perverse way your point of view, which is you cannot touch the infected, okay? Um, and the infected for Brahminical culture is obviously the Dalit, the Muslim, the woman who are mostly infecting not just um, human beings, but infecting society. So the pandemic, I suspect, will actually escalate costist Savarna um, ideologies and try to strengthen them. So our job in this context is very, very clear. We need to emphasize the work, not just the work, but the essential work of life making done by our Dalit comrades, right? Unless Dalit comrades produce the food that we eat, unless they clean the streets where we work, we would all die under these pandemics. So our job is to emphasize the necessity and essentialness of 
vulnerable people during this crisis because this crisis has proved beyond a shadow of doubt that it is the vulnerable and the least valued workers who actually reproduce our world, not the stockbroker and the Savarna politician. Uh, talking about stockbrokers, uh Recently, a Wall Street Journal editorial uh, makes the case to defund or reform the WHO because of the degree of Chinese control over it. So, Jacob asks, uh, what do you make of this and how are financial institutions going to change as a result of the crisis? And uh, another question with regard to work from home becoming more popular in this time. Uh, do you think uh, systems in which... Uh, production happens, uh, do you think that will be changing for and altering itself as a measure to survive in the post-pandemic world? Um, I think the Wall Street Journal is doing China bashing by saying the WHO is controlled by China. This is just nonsense. And the Wall Street Journal is always for the uh, breakup of, you know, national, uh, international uh, sort of institutions and bodies who do a minimum of public uh, welfare work, right? So in the UN, the WHO, these are things anathema to Wall Street and, um, and Trump. I mean, the thing is, why aren't they calling for the dismantling of the IMF? Uh, that is not really doing anything during the crisis. So why the WHO and not the IMF? So it just tells you what the Wall Street Journal's priorities and politics are. Um, the second question is, This uh, will the pandemic change how we work? Okay, so first of all, for c capitalism is a system of mass production. So large numbers of people need to work in collective ways in factories to produce goods. So that's not going to change at all, you know. So, and it's a system that relies, its lifeblood is profit. So it will not seize mass production and continuous production of things and goods unless it is forced to do so by workers. So the, the generalized sort of uh, production will not seize. And it will not, the pandemic will not change the way we do business. And this is why it's scary because Trump doesn't even want to stop it for the short term. He's saying that we should all go back to work as soon as possible. So, yeah, so the basic way we do work and produce goods in society under capitalism is not going to change. However, I think ruling classes and neoliberal institutions are going to use the excuse of the pandemic and the experience of the pandemic to actually produce some, uh, to, to propose some changes. For instance, I am really, really worried that universities are going to insist more and more on online teaching than on face-to-face -face meetings with students because they will say this is sort of, you know, this is, we've already established this during the pandemic, it worked really well. By the way, it doesn't work well. All my comrades are reporting that online teaching is not fun. And, you know, the, the only thing we like about our jobs as university professors is teaching our students, you know, and, and that human contact you have with students uh, in, in class and you get involved in their lives and you hear about their stories. I mean, online teaching absolutely uh, sucks. It, it just doesn't, I mean, you, you're not you're not a machine to impart a product, you know, that can be done online. But that's not your job as a professor. You're a mentor, you know, you you want to know about their lives, you want to learn from them. I learn from my students every day, okay? So, you know, but I am afraid that uh, things like that, uh, the pandemic might be used by neoliberal administrators to propose those kind of changes to jobs that can be done from Home. So, and that's going to be something we are going to have to fight. Uh, so, we've been talking a little over an hour now. So, maybe we can end with the last couple of questions. Uh, yeah, so, that, uh, just to end on after the pandemic and the post, when we're living in the post pandemic world, from what we are seeing around us today, we are seeing some major shifts in public attitude towards the degree in which governments can actually intervene in a lot of uh, production and in a bunch of other spheres which were supposed to be beyond the 
touch of the government. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so how how do you see the uh, change in attitude towards public health as a whole in the post-pandemic world? And from the experience of the Sanders campaign and the demand for Medicare for all, what do you think are the different ways in which people are responding to this demand, different sections are mobilizing around this demand. Maybe that could be the note on which we end this discussion and uh, figure out what to do next after this session ends. Right. So, um, so I think as Marxists, we need to be very clear on two things. One is that while we are seeing capitalist states go to extraordinary ends to, in order to uh, prioritize life-making activities under this crisis, we also know that it is increasing, the capitalist states are increasing its carceral functions alongside of you know, making more hospitals. Viktor Orban in um, Hungary has already um, said that he's going to rule by decree, so no need for legislators. Um, Israel is uh, increasing surveillance through all cell phone services. And by the way, Palestinians have no access to healthcare in Israel. Uh, second, uh, the third is, you know, so, um, uh, uh, Bolivia has just um, cancelled its elections. So, and and India, of course, uh, who could forget the sights of Indian police bleaching down migrant workers and beating uh, working class people to death. And police brutality on a secular scale has increased in India since the pandemic. So while we're looking at capitalist states being forced to provide public health to its citizens, we're also witnessing a rise in its carceral functions. Okay, so that's we should be aware of these two contradictory but simultaneous uh, developments in the capitalist um, forms of government. The second thing to say is capitalism is not going to learn a lesson from the pandemic. Okay, for off this, I'm absolutely sure. Once the pandemic passes, capitalism will try to go back to life as usual, Product, mindless production for profits, using fossil fuels, fracking, everything. So capitalism is not learning the lesson from the pandemic. Instead, it'll try to go back to its normal, okay? The consequence of that is if we allow capitalism to go back to its old normal, then we are facing a climate apocalypse. When that comes, the pandemic will seem like a holiday. Okay, we are we we will be looking at a devastation on a global scale so horrific that and where people will actually not have shelter in place choices even, that uh, there will be no coming back from it. There is a coming back from the pandemic. There will be no coming back from the climate apocalypse if we allow capitalism to continue this way. So our job is to make capitalism learn the lesson of the pandemic and to force it to use the measures it has used for the pandemic to use similar measures for the climate apocalypse coming. We force capitalism to ramp down useless production and raise the production of essential goods only so that we reduce the dependence on fossil fuels and ultimately eliminate it. We force capitalism to stop people from uselessly using, you know, Uh, fossil fuels and jet planes around the world simply to go, you know, to their second holiday home or whatever, and, um, and so on. So these measures, which we know capitalism is capable of making, as we are seeing in the pandemic, it is our job as the global left to force capitalism not to forget that these are the kind of measures that will be needed for the coming apocalypse that is coming from the climate emergency. Um, Lastly, I think what we are seeing, finally to end, I think what we are seeing through the pandemic is that while capitalism's response has been appalling 
uh, insufficient and often violent, we are seeing a tremendous response from working class people and ordinary people to help each other and to survive through the crisis. And that is also the lesson or the tool that we need to use Solidarity is should be our weapon in order to fight uh, and make capitalism remember this pandemic and to remember to constantly put our lives before its imperatives of profit. All right. I think uh, on behalf of everyone who joined in today, uh, this was an extremely educative session and. Uh, we have a collective, we would like to thank you Sam, for giving us your time today and we'd like to have more conversations like this in the future as well and discuss strategies and developments in all our countries. And for everyone who joined us uh, to listen, uh, this was uh, Professor Deshi uh, Bhattacharya talking about the response of the left in the US to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we hope you join us for future sessions as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, comrades, and take care of each other. Bye-bye.